This is a presentation on the history of women who influenced war journalism by Steffi Shulman. A Man's World Journalism and reporting were considered to be a man's job. War, whether fighting it or simply writing of what occurred and of the people involved, was considered man's work and something that women certainly couldn't do. Before we take a look at some of the females who paved the way for women in war journalism, let's take a look at where history currently stood during the times for women in any sort of newspaper or reporting business. Elizabeth Timothy was born in Amsterdam and was fully educated and came to America with her husband Louis and four children in 1731. By 1737, Elizabeth had had two more children and by 1738 found herself to be a widow. Timothy had aided her husband in his franchise newspaper business under the ownership and contract of Benjamin Franklin. With her oldest son Peter only being 14 and his father's contract with Franklin transferring to his name with the business, Timothy kept the business as usual running. Writing a letter to all of her readers in the first issue of the paper after her husband's death, Timothy pleaded with the readers and subscribers to continue their loyalty to the paper even though she would be taking over editing after her husband's passing. Running the newspaper under the printed name of Peter, her son, Timothy continued editing and publishing the paper until Peter's 21st birthday in 1746, at which point Timothy released the business to him, now being old enough to take responsibility. After turning over the business to Peter, Timothy opened a bookstore and stationery shop next door to the printing office. Timothy was a good editor and a smart businesswoman. In his autobiography, Franklin has said in regards to Lewis Timothy that he was, quote, a man of learning and honest, but ignorant in matters of account, end quote. Elizabeth Timothy, however, seemed to impress Franklin, for he has said that she, quote, not only sent me a clearer state as to what she could find of transactions past, but continued to account with the greatest regularity and exactness for every quarter afterwards, and managed the business with such success that she not only brought up reputably a family of children, but at the expiration of the term was able to purchase of me the printing house and establish her son in it." End quote. Timothy was able, after her husband's death, to increase not only the quality of the newspaper, but the readership as well. She is noted regularly as having been the first woman publisher. However, after my research, I have discovered that there were two that came before her. Anne Smith Franklin, a Boston-born woman, married James Franklin, brother to Benjamin Franklin. After James's death, in 1735, much like Elizabeth Timothy, Anne found herself in need to support a family alone. Anne was awarded the contract of the General Assembly's official printer after she had petitioned with them for printing work. Anne not only printed newspapers in her career, but also sermons, advertisements, and the currency of Rhode Island, as well as almanacs, making her the first woman to do so. Another among the first women in the newspaper business was Anne Catherine Zinger, who also inherited the business from her husband. Though Zinger didn't officially take over the business until her husband's death in 1744, Zinger is noted as having worked with her husband since 1725. She also ran the newspaper during his imprisonment from 1734 to 1736. In 1746, Zinger opened a bookstore, turning the print shop over to her son, John. Now, digging a little deeper into the women who influenced war journalism, we'll first look at Margaret Fuller. Margaret Fuller, 
a feminist writer, became the editor of the Dial in 1840. In 1846, she traveled to Europe, where she worked as a correspondent for the Tribune. Never before had a woman worked in such a position. Fuller was passionate about the Italian patriot movement and stayed to write eyewitness accounts of the activities. These stories were the first of their kind by a civilian reporter. During World War I, the War Department blatantly refused to accredit women, though many were sent by their editors to cover what they considered to be the woman's side of the war. Another young woman eager to write about the war was Dorothy Lawrence. Born in England and adopted by the church, Lawrence quickly became a freelance writer and by the age of 19 was off to France to cover the war. She tried with several failed attempts to enter the war zone as a woman aide, but was rejected and even arrested at times. After convincing a young soldier to assist her, he and nine other men smuggled out pieces of khaki uniforms so that Lawrence could disguise herself as a male soldier. In a book written by Lawrence later in life, she referred to the ten helpful men as the khaki accomplice. Lawrence further disguised herself by wearing a homemade corset to square up her frame and applied shoe polish to her face. After attaining foreign papers, Lawrence set out on a bicycle bearing the name of Private Dennis Smith. A tunnel digger named Tom Dunn discovered Lawrence and in an attempt to help her and to keep her safe from the lonely men at war, found her a cottage to sleep in when she wasn't in the trenches with the men by day. After ten days, Lawrence became ill and in an effort not to simply be found out and possibly get the soldiers who she had befriended in trouble, she turned herself in, only to be declared as a prisoner of war. She was forced to sign an affidavit swearing not to write of her experiences for the embarrassment it might cause, though she did later write a book of her accounts. Kansas-born Peggy Hull knew that journalism was her passion early on. Working as a typesetter for the local newspaper, Hull got a chance to show her writing skills after a local fire. Soon after, she became a writer working for the newspaper in Hawaii, California, Colorado, and Minnesota between 1909 and 1916. In 1917, knowing that the War Department did not accredit women journalists, Hull still left for Paris with the help of General Pershing and was able to spend nearly two months in an artillery training camp, but was soon sent back to Paris thanks to the envious male reporters that were there as well. Though Hull returned to the U.S. later, she didn't let one setback stop her from covering World War I firsthand. And in 1918, Hull traveled to Washington, D.C., and with the help of her friend, General Peyton C. March, received accreditation from the War Department, making her the first woman to do so. Though Hull often got stonewalled by other male reporters, she still managed to write on military actions from the Pacific Isles to Shanghai in Serbia. Though I could only find two sources for Cassandra's of the coming storm, it appears to be a name given to a group of women journalists, whether myth or not, due to their extensive knowledge and presence of reporting in the war. In this group, however fictitious, are listed the names of Helen Kirkpatrick, Dorothy Thompson, and Singrid Schultz. Helen Kirkpatrick was a New York-born woman who became well-educated and a passionate reporter. It is said that upon applying for a reporter position at the Chicago Daily News that the proprietor told Kirkpatrick, quote, we don't have women on the staff, end quote. Kirkpatrick swiftly replied, quote, I can't change my sex, but you can change your policy, end quote. Kirkpatrick got the job. Working in London, she kept tabs on the military movements and even interviewed the Duke of Windsor. 
Dorothy Thompson was once called the second most influential woman by Time magazine and is often referred to as the first lady of American journalism. Though she was highly involved with the issues of women's suffrage, Thompson moved to Europe in the 1920s and in 1925 was head of the New York Post's Berlin Bureau. This made her the first woman to hold such a position. Thompson is well known for her meeting and interviewing of Adolf Hitler in 1931, in which she later wrote about in her book, I Saw Hitler. In the book, she depicted the possible dangers should Hitler gain power, and Thompson was also involved in assisting Herschel Grishenplan, a Polish-German Jew whose assassination of a German diplomat was used as propaganda by the Nazis. Thompson's syndicated newspaper column was featured regularly in over 170 newspapers and was read by more than 10 million people. In the late 1930s, Thompson was also a radio commentator with one of the most popular broadcasts in the U.S. Sigrid Schultz moved to Germany from Illinois as a child when her father, a famous painter, got commissioned to paint the king and queen. She remained in Germany until the end of World War I. In 1919, Schultz joined the Chicago Tribune as chief investigator of Europe, the first woman to ever hold that title with such a news organization. Schultz, though opposed to the views of the Nazis, knew that a significant change was going to take place in Germany and as such, met and cultivated relationships with Nazi leaders such as Captain Hermann Göring to later use as sources. Though better known for her investigating and reporting than her writing, Schultz joined MBS in 1938 as a reporter among her existing position at the Chicago Tribune. With her ties to the inside, it was quoted that she was the most informed American in Berlin even granting her several interviews with Adolf Hitler himself. Schultz, as well as the other women listed here and those that were not, have left a legacy and have paved a way for journalists across the board, as well as the target of those female journalists. These women are prime examples of the actionable passion to want the truth and to be willing to fight and dig for it. In each of their cases, they are pioneers, told that they couldn't do it, yet, knowing that all things are possible with enough heart, hard work, and perseverance, 